Alright, so you are in Jeremiah chapter number 26, and the part of the chapter I want to focus on here is found in verse number 2. And the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. And the title of my sermon tonight is Diminish Not a Word. So when we think about the word diminish, what does it mean? It means to belittle or to water down or to shave off or like lessen the value of what is being said. And obviously God is giving this to Jeremiah so Jeremiah can go preach to the people and tell them, hey, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, God's going to bring judgment on this city. God's going to bring judgment. So obviously Jeremiah had to deal with a lot of adversity. And a part of that is the fact that he had to stay true to, uh, to, true to God and say, listen, I'm going to tell them exactly what you told me, and I'm not going to hold anything back. And we, be, we got to be people like that, that you know what, when we go out knocking people's doors and going and soul winning, we're not going to hold anything back from them. Amen. We're not going to tell them and butter them up and say, oh, yeah, you're on your way to heaven, and they're missing like 50% of the gospel. If you're missing 50% of the gospel, you're not saved. I'm sorry, my friend. They need 100% of the truth, the full unedited word of God. It has to be from the, the Lord's mouth. And a part of this I want to focus on too is this fact that we are a King James only church. We only read out of the King James version, not the new King James, not the ESV, not the NIV, because this is all a diminishment of the word of God. See, when we have, when we have God's word, we want to make sure that it's accurate, that it's been carefully translated, that it's not something that's just Oh, I just made up a word because I don't know what this means. No, this was something that God had. This word is, is God's inspired word. It is, it is without error. So I'll have you turn to uh, Psalm chapter number 12. Psalm chapter number 12. In verse number 6. And the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Look, God's going to preserve his word. You know, we shouldn't doubt whether or not the King James Bible is the inherent word of God or not. We should just trust that God has preserved this word or else we have nothing to stand on. Right. You know, if I'm going to go to all these other versions to try and figure out what the King James is saying, that means I'm not trusting the word of God. Right. And don't tell me that these and the thous are too difficult. Listen, if you study the word, you know what? It might take you an extra five or ten minutes to go do a quick Google search, but that doesn't mean that we should sit there and, oh, I don't understand it, so I'm just going to throw out the whole thing. That's hogwash. That's garbage. We shouldn't be adhering to any of that. And I don't care what James White says about his super hyper-theological terms and everything like that. It's a bunch of junk. You know, he, th he thinks he's too smart for his britches. He ain't smart at all. If you don't have the Word of God, he ain't smart. He has the NIV, the ESV, and a bunch of other junk. And he believes this foolish tulip doctrine that is, I, I hate it. I hate that. I hate that so much. So I'll have you turn to Genesis chapter 3. Now, what I wanted to kind of uh, uh, hit on in, in Jeremiah chapter 26, notice that obviously God's saying this for a reason. He's saying, don't diminish my words. Why? Because he's going to suffer persecution for it. Because you know what? Sometimes we're going to preach the word of God, and there's going to be people who are hating our guts for it. But you know what? we got to stand up and say, you know what? God said it. Let it rip. You know, we ought, we, ought, we ought not to be afraid to preach the word of God. We ought not to be afraid to tell the whole counsel of God, and we should just tell it like it is sometimes. And the Bible says this. The Bible says in, in, uh, in Jeremiah 26, verse 8, it says, Now it came to pass, when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. They wanted him dead. You know, they didn't like any of the things that were being said. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. They were ticked, man. And we got a bunch of false prophets out there that are ticked about this movement. We got the old IFB that are ticked. You know, I still love them. I still love the old IFB. I love the fact that they've taught great principles, but you know what? They hate our guts because we're preaching hard and we're not holding anything back. Amen. We're not diminishing God's word. I'm not about to sit here and diminish God's word or uh, give you a cracker with each, with each sermon. It's not going to happen. Genesis chapter 3. Let's take a look here in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the, the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Look, what is the gist of this? The serpent is twisting God's word. And that's what all these other perversions are. They're just a twisting God's word. Don't tell me that it says the same thing. And we're going to go through a couple of scriptures here where it does not say the same thing. It has completely changed the meaning of what God has said. And God is not pleased with that. And that is not getting anybody saved, my friend. That is not doing anything. That is not the incorruptible seed of God. It's just not. So I'll have you turn to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read for you in Genesis 2. The Bible says... And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may, uh, mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. We just ought to hang on what God says and not worry about what the serpent says or not worry about what the flesh says or not worry about what the old IFB says or some Pentecostal says. I don't care what any of them say. If the, if the God says it, it goes. That's, that's the end of the story. If God said it and it's clear in his word, we should just shut our mouth and say, all right, let's go take care of business then. If you want me to do something, I'll go do it, Lord, and I ain't going to back down. See, here's the thing is we have to stand on the promises of God. We have to stand in a place and not be moved because the moment that we make the decision and say, oh, I'm going to hold something back, well, that could be the difference between someone getting saved and not getting saved. You know, if I decide not to tell someone that they're on their way to hell, but I just give them, oh, just believe on Jesus, and they don't realize that they need, to, they need to, that they basically have to believe on Jesus to avoid going to hell, and they just think that, oh, I just believe on Jesus so I can go to heaven, but there's no punishment, there is no salvation in that. You need to be saved from something, so you can't leave anything out. You can't twist it. You, you got to stand firm on the word of God and diminish not a word. So you are in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. And the Bible says in verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The King James Bible, what we have in the English version. Listen, if you speak Spanish, it's not going to be the King James. It's going to be a different, it's going to be whatever the right version is for the Spanish speakers. Or if you speak Greek, then yeah, okay, go read the Greek. Not, I'm, not, I'm not against that. When we say King James only, we mean that if you speak English as your primary language, that's where you need to go. You don't need to go into any other sources. And, and it's funny to me that people haven't even read through the entire Bible, but yet they want to go to the book of Enoch for some extra biblical or these laws. Listen, God said that by the word of the Lord endureth forever. It's not, it's not going to fade away and then come back. It's not some hidden dead sea scroll somewhere that someone's going to dig up. It has abided forever. You know, once God has had those things penned down, it is permanent. It will last forever. It's not going to be hiding in some cave somewhere for 20 years or 100 years or 500 years. It's not going to happen. God would not let that happen. That's why we need to trust our King James Bible. Now, uh, I'll have you turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll read for you Isaiah 59, verse 21. The Bible says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Like I said, this is an unbroken chain of truth. This is not something that is just going to be tossed aside and then we're going to wake up one day and now we're using the NIV. Next week we're using the ESV. You know, even the new King James is just as wicked. You know, if you don't believe me, you need to pick one up and compare scripture with scripture. And you can see there's a huge difference in what that is saying and what the King James Bible is saying. 
I don't care if it has the word King James in it or not. If it's not, if it's not the King James Bible, the authorized version, it's not the same. If it's got different words, you know, and you're going to sit there and tell me that, oh, they're just changing it to make it easier. No, that is not true. I can go through countless of scriptures where, one, the words that are being used are completely different, and two, sometimes even more complicated, you know, and, and I, it just, it, it irritates me because I don't see how anyone would want to read a word that has been changed multiple times or verses have been taken out. I can't trust that. I don't want to read something like that. Even if one Bible verse is missing, I don't want to read it. Amen. I don't trust it at that point. Who knows what the person did, you know, as they were, as they were doing their uh, translating after they'd already taken these words out. Not going to happen. It's going to abide forever. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye, ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day... Uh, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, this is a God-breathed book. It's inspired by the Holy Ghost, and prophets and men of God had penned these things down with the inspiration of God. So I can trust this as I trust the word of God. Thank you. So, I'm, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, atheist community and people who are against the Bible. Well, man just wrote that. Well, I don't believe that. I hope you don't believe that either because this is all inspired by God's word. Oh, just the, just the stuff in the red. That's, just, that's all Jesus said. No. Je Jesus is the word, my friend. Jesus is the word. Every word is pure. This is all the word of God. You know, I'm not going to be hating on you if you use a red letter edition. I use a red letter edition. I like it. But the fact of the matter is, is every single word is out of the mouth of God himself. So I don't want to hear this junk, oh, it's just the red, or it's just this, it's just that. No, the entire word is inspired by God. This was all inspired. I'll have you turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> chapter, chapter number 2. Verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, what I want to talk about here, that's the King James. Amen. You guys want to know what the ESV says? No. I'm sure, yeah, probably not. <laughs> Good point. But I'm going to say it anyway, just to prove to you, that they're changing things just to prove to you that the devil is behind this movement of these new false versions and it gets more wicked than the ESV trust me if you've ever read the message Bible that is a load of crap that is a crap I mean it says oh faith and works hand in glove no 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 that's not what that's not what the Bible says it is not faith and works hand in glove bunch of and, and it's just like a three-year-old wrote it come on the ESV, this is what the ESV says. It says, now remember, it says, by which also ye are saved. Now pay attention here. In the ESV, it says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. No, it's, it's you are saved, Amen. not being saved. You don't be saved. It's not, it's not a thing that you fall into or you, you grow into. You're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a done deal at that point. Once you're saved, you're always saved. It's not, it's not a process. It's you put your trust in the Lord Jesus and you're saved. Don't give me this ESV crap. I don't want to ever see one around here. We kick people out for that. All right, so, and then what about 1 John 5, 7? Try and find that one of the newer versions. It's not even there. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen. Why do you think there's an attack on the Trinity today? Why Amen. do you think this oneness modalists want to go back to all these other versions? Well, it's not really supposed to be there. Yes, it is, and God put it there for a reason. Amen. And you know what? There's the devil tampering with the Word of God today. There's false prophets tampering with the Word of God and diminishing what God has said. And we need to stand on the doctrines that the Bible has. And it's no coincidence that all these doctrines, the ones that are being attacked today, are the ones that have been removed from these other versions, the ones that have been perverted. It's no wonder. Marvel not. I mean, it's obvious what they're doing. It's very obvious. And it's wicked. And God's not pleased with anybody who diminishes his word. 
He's not pleased at all. And listen, God has a really strong punishment for those that will tamper with his word. It's not, it's not like, oh, I can just play around with this stuff. No, God's taking this seriously. God's word, I mean, he didn't come to Jeremiah and say, oh, you know what, if you just say, you know, you could tell them this, but they might get, if they get offended, you can kind of pull back a little bit. No. He told them, diminish not a word. Amen. He was dead serious when he said it. And who would have known what would have happened if Jeremiah wouldn't have followed through? Right. Something bad could have happened. I mean, we need to stand on God's word, and I would rather fear God than fear man anyways. I don't care if you're coming to kill me. I don't care if you're mad that I'm preaching against the sodomites. I don't care if you're mad that I'm preaching against this or that. I don't care. I'm going to stand on the word of God from today and forever. Revelation 22, this is their punishment, the ones that would tamper with God's word. I mean, this is serious, guys. This is not a joke. God's not playing around. Revelation 22:18. Now, now, some people would say, okay, well, adding to God's word isn't diminishing it. Well, you're diminishing the value. Amen. You're diminishing the value by adding because now you're watering down the message. You're, you're, you're making it something that it's not. You are diminishing it. So the Bible says in Revelation 22, 18, it says, For I testify unto you every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, and if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You know what God says? You do this, you tamper with God's word, he turns you into a stinking reprobate. That's what he does. Your name has now been removed from the book of life. You know what? We all start out in the book of life, but there comes a point where either a person dies, I believe, or you, you, you pass this where you either hate God or you, you know, obviously you have to hate God to want to tamper with his word intentionally. And he removes your ability to ever get saved. And some people look at, wow, I know. It's right here. It's, right, it's the last chapter in the Bible, my friend. Why don't you take a look at it? You know, if anything, I would assume that most people read Genesis 1 and Revelation 22 the most. You should be able to find that pretty easily, you know. And, and here's the thing is, is, is people, are, you know, the old IFB, they want to hang on to the stinking Schofield. I don't want any of that junk. All those commentaries, yes. They might, might not be scratching out words, but they're putting something in the bottom that says that's not really what it means. Oh, 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 you can ignore that. That was, that was a different dispensation. I cannot believe how many times I've been told that's a different dispensation. Oh, that's not for you. That's for the Jews. Well, how much of the Bible can I read? You know, can I, can I just, you know, why can't I just open the Bible and say, wow, that, that's for me. That's for me. You know what, my friend, every word of God is for you. Whether you like it or not. And you know what? These corrupted Bibles, this Schofield junk, Ruckman idiot Bible, you know what? Those can all burn in hell with that, their little false prophets too. All those, all those little add-ons, I don't like it. It's not cute. You know, I can read the word. For, I'm, a, I'm a big boy now. I can read the word. You know, if you can read the English language, you can do this. Amen. Don't be scared. You know, there are some, you know, there are some tough words in here. There, you know, sometimes it, it might take you a while to figure something out. But you know what? You need to you need to pull you know you need to pull yourself up and just say you know what? Let's just read the word and just get to ask God for his, you know to fill you with the Spirit and just get right into it. And you know, that's what we have preaching here for too. You know, and you're gonna go home and you can check what I'm saying. You can go home and and compare scripture to scripture. I encourage people to do that. I encourage people to go home and read the word. And if you don't, if something doesn't make sense at this time, you know what? Just skip over it and keep reading. You're not going to get everything all at once. But what do these lazy people want to do? They want to open up their reference Bible and say, oh, this guy, you know, Peter Ruckman said this about this dispensation. I don't care what any of these guys have to say. And all these Calvinists too, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to hear it from any of them. I don't want to hear it from any of them. And it's just sad that the old IV hangs on to this. Open up to your Schofield reference Bible. Get out of here. Get out of here with that junk. I don't want to see it. Stinking Schofield reference Bible. They reverence that more than the Word of God itself. There's more notes than Bible, my friend. It's crazy. It's insane. So let's change, let's change gears here real quick. So I'll have you turn to 2 Timothy 4. Let's get into like not holding back the truth. That's really what this message is about. I wanted to really hit on the King James only just as a reminder for everyone that this is a church that exalts the King James Bible. Oh, you're exalting a book. Well, God is the Word. Jesus is the word, so I will exalt the words that he has said. The Bible says that his, his words are spirit and they are life. I'm going to hang on every word that he has. I'm going I'm I'm to eat it up like honey. That's what I'm going to do. This is, good, this is good doctrine. It's good stuff. 
It's not some uninspired Mormon book or anything like that. This is the true word of God. Amen. 2 Timothy 4, the Bible says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I mean, this is the most true statement of today. I mean, this is something that's, this prophecies came true, my friend. There are people out there, that pretty much every regular church, every other church that you go to is preaching some sort of itching ear doctrine, some new thing, some cute little message, some Tyler Doka stupidity. You know, the earth is flat now. Like, they're, they're just turned aside into fables. That's what they're doing. Because they're not hanging on this word. They're, on, they're hanging on YouTube. They're hanging on the, the next false prophet, the next, the next guy who's making a bunch of money. That's who they're hanging on. They're not hanging on every word of God. And it's just, it, it bothers me sometimes. And, and it's like, they're not even willing to stand up and say what's right. You know, if something, if there's an elephant in the room, they're too afraid to call it out. You know, how many times have we heard of all these scandals in the old IV of all this ridiculous nonsense that that won't happen here. And if it does, it's going to get nipped in the butt real quick. And we're not going to tolerate any of that garbage. And we're not going to be all cute about it and say, oh, it's just, uh, it was this. And, 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 you know, and call adultery, or, uh, call adultery an affair. It's not an affair. You know, you hear all these watered down terms from them and they make it sound all cute. They put a blanket over it and they will not stand up for the truth anymore. And it's sad to see because there was a day. It's funny. I was listening to some old IFB stuff just out of curiosity because I didn't grow up in the old IFB to be quite honest with you. I was only there for a few years, you know. I was kind of born into this movement, thank God. But I was curious, what are they preaching, you know? And, and there's some preachers that do hold on to the truth, and they do preach hard, and they do, you know, kick people out of church if, if need be. They do discipline. They do make sure that their, their flock is being fed, and they're actually using Bible. But you look back, and a lot of it is fluff. A lot of it is just fun and games. It's all smiles. It's we all riled up on this one topic, but when it comes to actually digging deep into the, the Word of God and actually using God's Word, it's very little. It's diminished, my friend. It's diminished. And it's sad to see because I want them to succeed. You know, I don't want them to fail. They're my brethren. Amen. You know, I love those people, but they need to get back on fire for God. Amen. You know, and we ought to stay the same way. It doesn't mean that that can't happen to us one day. You know, make sure you guys are, are, are consistent. Because we don't want to, we don't want to put that bad name on Christ. Because we're out here representing Jesus Christ. We're not out here playing games. This is not a game. So let's take a look here in John, um, John chapter six. Go to John chapter six. And it's funny about this too. Like when it says, "For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall, they shall heap to themselves uh, teachers having itching ears." I was, uh, when I was younger, I was in college, and I was at a, like a Bible sort of camp, I guess. They called it InterVarsity. It was, I went to just a worldly college. I'm not proud of it. But I was curious at the time, this was before I was saved, and I was, you know, was kind of, I guess you would say, dabbling with church, I guess, which is just go all in. But um, they had this group, and, and they, they had, there was nothing about them that was Christ-like at all. You know, when you read the Bible, that they don't represent it at all. It was all one big fun light show. It was a disco, and uh, they would do their things on they would do their things on Wednesday nights or whatever. I I, I couldn't call it preaching because there wasn't any word of God that was being used at all. You know, even if it was that one NIV verse, and it was just you know God loves you. All right, good night, guys. Um, so I remember talking to this lady um, that was one of the the leaders at that. You know, I wouldn't call it a church, but one of the leaders, at the organization. And uh, I remember I told my friends, hey, let's go check out another church, you know. And then there was this church down the street, and it was by the school. I was, like, I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to this church. Do you know anyone there? And I was just asking this lady just to see if she knew anything. And she says, oh, don't go to that church. I'm like, well, why not? She goes, they don't, they don't let women preach. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at her because I don't know anything at the Bible at this point. I know nothing. And I'm, like, I'm kind of like, why did she bring that up? And she's like, she's like, just be careful with them because, you know, they're very legalistic and... She's like, just be careful, like, um, and I asked her questions, like, what do you mean? Like, and she's like, well, the Bible does say that, you know, women should keep silence, but, um, but she made an excuse for it, and she was basically saying that 
She basically said that it was only for that time or it was only because the laws were saying that at that time. And I remember going to, and I was kind of searching this out, and I was like, what is she talking about? Because if, if that seems kind of weird to me. So I actually, I'm going to have you turn to 1 Corinthians 14 real quick. We'll, we'll, we'll come back over. But I was curious. I was like, what is she talking about? So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, it says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So she was straight up lying to me. I don't know what version she was using, but I remember sitting there. I'm not going back there again. She straight up lied to me. And I don't know how, you know, I was just like, that's crazy. And, and, and then you know, obviously when I found Pastor Anderson, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense now. But I remember having the word of God with me. And I'm like, I'm so glad I got to compare that crap to what scripture actually says. You know, and it was just, it was a funny story. But uh, we're going to move on. John 6, John 6. I was like, I can't believe you said that. It says, also say at the law. It's, it's an addition to what the law was at that time. Right. It's not just that, oh, that's Old Testament, or that's, you know, that's this. No. The word of God is consistent. John 6, in uh, verse number 53, the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of his bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? And you know what? A lot of the things that we're saying today, it offends a lot of people. Right. You know, you go to any video on that YouTube channel for any Baptist church or any independent Baptist church, there are trolls on there just waiting to attack you for every little thing. You preach against the smallest of matters, and they get super offended. And they're not even involved in it. It's like you preach against the sodomites, and they're not like, it's like, it makes you wonder, like, are you a sodomite? Because you're really defending them, like you, you really love them or something. But here's the thing, is I'm not going to stop preaching the Word of God, and neither should you. And you know, you might think to yourself, well, you know what? I'm not a pastor. I'm not going to be a preacher. You know, I'm just me. Well, you know what? You're knocking doors every week. And you're talking to people, and you need not to diminish the Word of God. And even amongst your family members, let's say you're a dad, and you don't, you know, let's say you never aspire to be a pastor or a preacher one day, you ought to be preaching to your family. Amen. You ought to be giving them the Word. And you know what? If you're afraid to tell, tell them and warn them of things, you're, your family is going to be destroyed because you're not willing to stand up and give it, give it all you got, you know, and say, listen, you know, tell your wife, it's not appropriate. You know, you, can't, you tell your daughter, hey, that's not appropriate. We ought to be doing this for the Lord. You know, ought to be reproving our family so we can build them up in the Lord because, you know what, sometimes that our family members can be weaker, weaker vessels. You know, especially the women, we need, to, we need to help them along, encourage them. But we also need to be strong in the Word of God and not hold anything back and just be honest and say, listen, the Bible says this. You know, like it or lump it, but this is where we're going. Amen. You know, this is, this is the direction we're going. And people get offended at words in the Bible, which surprises me. But they get bent out of shape. For example, I'm not doing this to be cute either. I'm just giving you an example. Piss, bastard, whore, hell, damnation. Words that are being plucked out of all these other versions. Oh my gosh, he said hell. Yeah, the Bible mentions hell a lot. And you know what? You ought to know what hell is. I don't know what sheol is, okay? I don't know what hate. Like, I do know what it is. I'm being facetious. But, but Hades is not going to get the point across, my friend. Yeah. It's hellfire and brimstone. It's burning. It's everlasting torment is what it is. And we need to be straight with our words and not diminish anything. Matthew 5, the Bible says, Blessed are they which, uh, which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for their, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and, you shall, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my, my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, 
wherewith shall be salted. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Listen, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to preach the word of God, and I'm not going to let anything, I'm not going to hold anything back, even if men shall revile me. You know, we should glory in that persecution and give that to Jesus Christ and say, Amen. You know, we should say amen when we're getting persecuted. You know, when we get kicked off someone's porch because they hate our guts, they hate our church. You know what? We're out doing a good work. We're out loving people by preaching them the gospel. We're not holding anything back. And you know what? If we're hated in the process, then amen to that. Amen. You know what? I'll take that. That little bit of persecution, that little bit of, uh, of, of torment for a season so that I can reap the benefits later on in life. So I can say, you know what? I was, I was beat down, I was, I was bruised, people hated me, they reviled me, but you know what? I didn't, I didn't take a step back. Amen. I didn't diminish God's work. God, I did what God asked me to do. Amen. You know what? That, that takes some guts. You know, there's a big reward for that when you stand firm on the word of God. I guarantee you God will reward you for that. God's pleased with that. He loves that. He's, he's, not, gonna, he's not gonna criticize you like these idiots are. They're like, oh, they're preaching too hard. He's not gonna, he's, Jesus preached hard. Preach hard sermons, my friend. Jesus was a man. He was not some, some limp-wristed little guy up on stage with skinny jeans. He was a man, and he preached hard. So we ought to do the same. And we have too many pastors out there. They're too afraid of their own congregation. They're too afraid of their shadow. They can't even preach it to themselves without crying, you know? It's crazy. And, it, and they get all squeamish when we talk about hard subjects. It's like, come on. Let's put some pants on and preach the word of God. Let's be like men. Amen. Acts 20, the Bible says, Wherefore I take you unto, uh, unto uh, record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare you unto all counsel of God. Take he, heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to flee the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of yourselves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after, there, after them. Therefore watch and remember that the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Listen, if we're not preaching hard, you know, those wolves are going to come in and take people away. And I'm not going to let that happen. You know, I know Brother Bruce is not going to let that happen. Yeah. If we love the brethren, we're going to let it rip. And we're going to tell yeah. it like it is. Yeah. You know, we're not going to diminish anything from God's word. Because as soon as someone compromises on God's word, there's a whole bunch of problems that accompany that. God's just going to let the pestilence come in. God's going to let the freaks in. God's going to let the perverts in. Because you're not on the word of God. Yeah. It happens too often, my friend. And, I, and it sickens me. It makes me sick. James 4, I'll read it for you. If you want to turn to... Um, I'm going to skip through some stuff here. If you want to turn to Jeremiah 42, I'm going to read for you James 4. James 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is an enemy with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God? Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Listen, the scripture does not say anything in vain. It's for a reason. Every word has a purpose. It's not just vanity. It's not just filling up space. God's not just trying to be, you know, he's not trying to be cute by making the Bible thick. Every word matters, my friend. We shouldn't just skip over the Old Testament or skip over this book or skip over this chapter we ought to be going through every chapter, line by line, precept upon precept, and not miss a beat, my friend. We have a lot of time to do it. You know, you have, we have a lifetime to learn God's word. So we need to take advantage of that. But what do people want to do? They want to cut corners. Oh, I read the New Testament. Okay, great. That's like, that doesn't take too long. That doesn't take too long at all. So don't be proud of those, I mean, if, it's a, if you're new, newly saved, that is a big feat for you then. Because I know it took me a while to get into the Word of God. It took me a while to say, you know what, i got to buckle up, i got to man up, and i got to read this Word because God's got something in here for me. And I did start with the New Testament. But there's a time and place for everything. If you've been saved for years and years and years and you're neglecting God's Word, and you say, well, I've already read it once, I've already read it twice. No. 
We need to keep going, keep moving forward, because every word is going is, is li to, it's living, you know, it's alive, and it's going to help us throughout different seasons in our life, kind of what Brother Bruce was talking about this morning, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's all important. It's important to stay on there. Jeremiah 42, the Bible says, And all the captains of the forces, and uh, Johanan, the son of Korea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hos uh, Hoshiah, and all the people from the least, even unto the greatest, came near, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us, the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord God may show us the way wherein we walk, and that thing we may do. <clears throat> then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you, behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you, I will keep nothing back from you. And you know what? We ought to be like Jeremiah that says, you know what? I'm not going to hold anything back. That's right. I'll declare it unto you. I'll be the man that says, you know what? This is right and this is wrong. Right. I'm not going to run scared like the world. I don't care what they have to say. They're not going to influence me. You know, we better take heed of these things. We better be like the prophet of Jeremiah and just tell it like it is and just tell your people, listen, I'm not going to hold anything back from you. Why? Because you love that person. The person that, that hates their friend is not going to tell them that they're wrong. They're not, going to go, they're not going to go to the Christmas party and say, hey, listen, we don't drink, so I don't want any alcohol around us. Amen. Nothing, not a drop. But you know what the, the, the weakling does? He compromises. He holds back. You know, hopefully you're spending time with a family that's saved over Christmas. But when they start getting involved in wickedness, you need to put your foot down and say, no, I don't care if you're saved or not. I'm not, I'm not hanging around this junk. We got to go. We're in the car. You got two options. You put the booze away or we're going home. Those are your two options. Amen. We're not compromising. Oh, you're being mean to your family. No, I love them. Because you know what choice I want them to make? You know what choice I want them to decide? It's to sit there and say, you know what? I love you too, so for the sake of tonight, I'm going to put this stuff away. And you know what? Maybe that'll last longer than that one night. You know, pray to God that they can get rid of that junk. Amen. But we, we, ought, we ought to stay clean during those holidays. We ought to stay right with God and stand up for truth and not keep our mouth shut. Amen. Open your mouth boldly. I'll be turning to Ezekiel 3. We're almost done here. Ezekiel chapter 3. In verse 16, the Bible says, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and, turn, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also that how thou hast delivered thy soul. So what's the principle of this? What is God saying? He's saying, listen, you're better off just letting it rip and saying, this is, this is, this is what's going to happen to you if you continue in this sin. God's going to destroy you. But you know what? Guess who's at fault? If, you know, obviously the wicked is going to be punished regardless. You know, they're going to have to pay for their sins in hell if they're not saved. Or they're going to have to pay for the sins on this earth that they've reaped what they've sown but you know what? If a prophet stands up, if a preacher stands up, and, and, or someone that you love, and you tell them the truth, at least blood won't be on your hands. Amen. At least you're clean, and you can stand before them, and you can stand before God, and, and when there's judgment, you can sit there and say, hey, I told you. Hey, I, t I told you the truth, but you didn't listen to me. You know what? I would rather them be the last option where if they warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, 
he shall surely live, I would take that any day of the week. But you know what? That's not everyone. Not everyone is going to go the right way when you rebuke them. Not everyone's going to go the right way when you preach hard. Not everyone's going to go the right way when you tell them that their, their, their deeds are evil. But you know what? I'd rather just say it because at least it's off my hands at that point. I'd rather go out there and knock every door and get turned away from everyone than to stand before God and say, oh yeah, I just, I didn't do anything. How ashamed would you feel if you got before God and you stood before God and God says, well, what did you do? Sat on your hinder parts while those people are out there going to hell. So we need to go out there and preach them the gospel. And if they like it, I love it. And if they lump it, so be it. You know, I'm happy because I'm putting the effort out there and doing it. And you should be happy with that too. Obviously, we should be more joyful when we come back reaping a bunch of people and seeing them saved. Amen. That, that, that makes my heart glad. But you know what? Not everyone's going to choose that route. Not everyone is going to be able to take that well. And at least the blood is off your hands. Last, last verse of the night. I'll have you turn to John 15. John 15. <clears throat> Man, I, I'm hearing that the old IFB is kind of getting a little more on fire for soul winning. Amen. I like it. Amen. I'm glad we put a lighter under their rear, rear parts, you know. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we sparked up. You can be mad as me as you want, but hey, the blood's off my hands. You know, I, I'm glad I provoked you to do some good works. Because we're on the same team, my friend, whether you like me or not. We're on the same team. Right. And I will only speak that which is good as far as, um, you know, my old pastor and everything like that. Soul winning? Amen. I'm not going to, why would I hate someone who's soul winning? Yeah. If you're doing the work, I love you. If you're preaching the right gospel, I love you. I'm not going to uh, talk down upon you or anything like that. Now, if you're slothful, you're preaching a weird gospel, Amen. or you're, be, you're, doing, you're letting a bunch of garbage in your church, and yeah, I'm going to have to fire up again, but hey, if you're on the right path, I'm going to give you a high five on the way, way to heaven. You know? So we should be on the same team. John 15, verse 18. This is the last verse we're going to go to. The Bible says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said, said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. And let this resonate in your minds tonight and, and think upon the fact that, listen, we're going to be preaching the whole counsel of God and not everyone's going to love you for it. Right. If you could take one thing away from tonight, it's, it, it, it's th th simply this. It's, it's this th and the fact that we shouldn't diminish God's word for anything. Amen. We shouldn't compromise. If God has shown you something through the word, obviously it shouldn't be a private interpretation. We should all be able to agree on the same doctrine. But if, if, if it's what God says, you shouldn't care what the world thinks of you because God says they're going to hate you anyways. Right. You might as well just do something with it. You might as well just get out there and let it rip. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to preach, Lord. I just pray that this message was a blessing to those <clears throat> listening, God. I just pray that you'll give us good fellowship. And I also pray for the health of uh, the Mejias and that you will comfort them tonight and uh, give them strength to continue. And uh, thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord. Help us be great soul winners. Help us not diminish your word and help us stand on your promises, God. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.